please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Days before Yogi Adityanath completes one year as the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, the BJP has suffered a major jolt in his bastion. For the first time in nearly three decades, the BJP has lost the Lok Sabha Gorakhpur constituency, stunned by the Akhilesh Jadav Mayavati combined. And it's not just Gorakhpur, the BJP has also lost the Poolpur Lok Sabha constituency that was left vacant by Kesha Prasad Maurya, the Deputy Chief Minister of UP. So effectively, the BJP has lost out in UP in both seats home to the sitting chief minister and the deputy chief minister. Meanwhile, in Bihar, Tejasvi Yadav, the son of Lalu Prasad Yadav, who is in jail, has managed to have his party, the RJD, retain the Araria Lok Sabha seat, beating Nitish Kumar's JDU. This was the first poll test for Nitish after he decided to take the BJP's support to state chief minister. For the Congress party, it's been a dismal show in all three seats where they decided to contest alone. Rahul Gandhi took to Twitter and called the result an expression of anger against the BJP. He also admitted that the Congress needs to rebuild in Uttar Pradesh and it cannot happen overnight. Here are the sounds and sights from Gorakhpur and Fulpur, where the Samajwadi party has emerged victorious. जो ये जनता ने फैसला दिया है यह अप्रत्याशित है जब एक मुख्यमंत्री का क्षेत्र हो कई वर्षों से जिसको किसी ने नहीं हरा पाया हो उन क्षेत्रों की जनता में इतनी नाराजगी अगर है तो सोचिए आने वाले समय में अगर देश का चुनाव होगा तो कैसा होगा So setback for the BJP in UP. Meanwhile, the government today got the Lok Sabha to approve the budget for the upcoming fiscal without any discussion, and that is highly unusual. The finance bill, which highlights the government's tax proposals as well as the appropriation bill, that contains details of various government departments were passed by a voice vote. This amidst uproar by opposition parties. They have criticized the government, accusing it of trying to pass the finance bill without discussion. In fact, the bill has 21 amendments and three new clauses. Also, the passage of the finance bill has ended the speculation over the long-term capital gains with just a minor change for unlisted securities. So LTCG stays. After this tweak, LTCG on unlisted shares accrued till the 31st of January 2018 will be grandfathered, so the finance bill is now through. The other big story at this hour, RBI Governor Urjit Patel has broken his silence over the Punjab National Bank fraud. In a speech delivered at the National Law University in Gandhinagar, the governor defended the Reserve Bank and said that it's simply infeasible for a banking regulator to be in every nook and corner of banking activity. He went on to add that the RBI's regulatory powers over public sector banks are weaker than those over private sector banks. Ritu joins us now with more on Governor Patel's defense. Ritu, take us to the highlights of uh, the RBI governor's speech. Well, you know, this is the first time ever that the Reserve Bank of India governor has broken his silence on the PNB fraud. And I quote, he said, even the RBI is hurt uh, at the incidence of such frauds. But two key points emerging from the speech that he made at Gandhi Nagar today. One, that RBI alone is not to blame. And two, uh, RBI's hold, regulatory hold over public sector banks is not really, uh, you know, as good as its hold on private sector banks. Uh, first, to start with, on the PNB fraud specifically, he says, it was simply infeasible for the Reserve Bank of India to be in every nook and corner. Now, some critics may blame that a small fraud could go unnoticed, but a 12,000 crore rupee fraud was, a t was too big a fraud for RBI to just not have seen. Uh, he also said that RBI issued precise instructions thrice in 2016 to banks to uh, strictly, uh, you know, warning them of such cybersecurity risks. And yet, uh, there were inefficiencies in the Punjab National Bank's internal board uh, that they were not able to adhere to these ad advisories uh, given by Reserve Bank of India repeatedly. Uh, he also went on to say, uh, you know, the ownership of uh, public sector banks is not uh, neutral. The regulatory powers of the RBI is not ownership neutral. He said uh, that the regulatory powers over public sector banks is weaker than those over private banks because public sector banks are largely also governed by the finance ministry and this deep uh, fissure in the landscape of banking regulation, which is dual in its nature, uh, that is the finance ministry and the RBI both regulating on it, is bound to lead to tremors and issues 
issue, uh, you know, result in frauds like the PNB scam that has happened. Uh, he also said that there was a need to refocus on, uh, you know, larger issues at this point of time, which he specifically said is the stressed asset problem. He said uh, the current stress that we are looking at is higher than a eight and a half uh, than the eight and a half lakh crore stress that is visible on banks' balance sheets. And to tackle that, he said that the Reserve Bank of India had come out on with new divergence norms specifically to target these and results will show on this front. He also defended the Feb 12th circular on new NPA resolution norms saying uh, that at the center of these new norms is the IBC framework which he says is one of the most important legislations to have come out in the credit space in several decades and that will help minimize uh, you know public sector banks bad assets uh, over the long term and lastly he ended with some suggestions uh, to revitalize public sector banks uh, hinting at uh, you know privatization of the public sector banks he laid out various uh, you know uh, guidances uh, for uh, the government to follow when it comes to public sector banks and their revitalization saying that the banking regulatory powers must be neutral to bank ownership and there should be a level playing field between the private and the public sector banks well, that's important, uh, those comments. They're coming in from the RBI governor. As Ritu pointed out, it's the first time that the governor has spoken after the PNB fraud came to light. In fact, uh, taking forward some of those issues highlighted by the RBI governor in our special series, PSP 2.0, where we discuss the road ahead for PSU banks, we've been raising these very questions. And we did that with former RBI governor as well as policymakers. We've asked them about the role that the Reserve Bank could play to prevent such scams. And we've also discussed the need for governance reforms at PSU banks. Let's hear out what Bimal Jalan, Raghuram Rajan and Montek Singh Aluwali have to say. In fact, just on that issue of uh, the RBI not having the power over PSBs as it does over the private sector banks. It was Montek Singh Aluwalia who told us in this special series that he believes the Department of Financial Services should in fact be disbanded because it gives more power to the finance ministry and the government over public sector banks versus the Reserve Bank of India. Listen in. The public sector banks are actually regulated both by the Reserve Bank and by the Ministry of Finance. Now, in my view, and I've had this for some time, I don't think that finance ministry control over the public sector banks is adding any value at all. I mean, I personally feel that, uh, and this has been recommended, by the way, by expert committees. I think the Narasimham Committee, way back in 1997, had said that we should take government ownership below 30% uh, and essentially uh, government can appoint nominees on the board, but they don't have to be government officers. So actually the Department of Financial Supervision, what used to be called the Banking Division, can even be abolished. The main issue that we have to grapple with is that public sector banks, which are spread all over, decentralization. I mean, I'm in favor of decentralization of the process. The government, the government should decide on policy. Okay. I mean that public sector banks or priority sector lending or what the interest rate uh, uh, should be and so on and so forth that the Reserve Bank decides. The two combination, the Reserve Bank and the uh, government, yeah. I mean they, they would decide what should be the policy, what should be the interest rate, where, how, what should be the outreach and so on and so forth. But the governance part, that is how a public sector bank should be run that must be delegated and decentralized to the uh, to and what you might say an autonomous agency if you look at upsc if you look at the election commission they are public institutions and they deliver i mean the, the largest free and fair elections in human history is delivered by election commission absolutely if you look at all our ias administrative system it is through the upsc so what i'm saying is essentially i'm one, trying to emphasize is, and, why, and you ask yourself the question that why is it that we have institutions of this type, we have institutions of this type, we have institutions of CAG type and they function very well because they don't have to report to the ministry. If everything comes from orders from the ministry as opposed to the board determining things, uh, including the appointments of the board, uh, then essentially you've taken off, off uh, you know, powers from the board, rendered it fairly toothless, and then you expect it to manage the bank in, its, in the bank's best interest. I, I think we need to think very seriously about public sector bank governance reform. 
Well, former RBI governors and policymakers there on some of the recommendations that have come in from RBI Governor Urjit Patel on reimagining public sector banks. On to the action from the Lal Street, a comeback of sorts for the markets, which witnessed a strong rally in the last hour of trade. This after a weak start to the session, the Nifty did manage to reclaim 10,400 after breaching that level in today. The Sensex ended almost flat with a negative bias. Broader markets outperformed with the mid caps and bank stocks gaining about half a percent or so. The time for us to head into a break, but up next, Raghuram Rajan on Trump's tariff policies. Meanwhile, sources tell CNBC that Trump administration is considering indefinite tariffs and investment restrictions against China. That and more when we get back. Also on the show, the special CBI court lets off the Marin brothers in the illegal telephone exchange case, says there's no prima facie evidence to prove the charges against them. While U.S. President Donald Trump has long been concerned about the U.S.'s widening trade deficit with China, sources tell CNBC that the Trump administration is now seeking to impose tariffs of up to $60 billion on Chinese imports, and these tariffs will be targeted at technology and the telecommunications sectors. CNBC's Iman Harvez has the details. Iman, what are sources telling you? Reuters is reporting that it's $60 billion worth of goods that the Trump administration would put a tariff on coming in from China. There was a report earlier in the day yesterday that the president was offered a package of $30 billion of tariffs, said, no, I don't like that. I want a bigger number. And Reuters then reported later in the afternoon that the number would be $60 billion of goods coming in that would be hit with this new tariff. I'm also talking to sources who tell me there are other things under consideration inside the White House beyond just these tariffs. Take a look. Uh, at a quick cheat sheet here. Uh, it's tariffs that are being considered, but also investment restrictions on money coming in from China into the United States, and then possible visa restrictions <clears throat> on Chinese travelers coming to the United States. All of this designed, I am told, to chip away at this number. This is the deficit, trade deficit between the United States and China, $347 billion. The president often refers to it as $500 billion. He'd like to chip that number down to something a lot more manageable. There have been diplomatic overtures with the Chinese asking the Chinese for their ideas on how to lower that trade deficit. We'll see if those diplomatic efforts uh, bear any fruit here. Uh, but that is the state of play right now. This, this administration on trade, very focused on protectionism and very much focused on China. Iman, thanks very much for joining us. So uh, it doesn't look like there's any de-escalation on the tariff war front. In fact, former RBI Governor Raghu Ram Rajan says that we haven't seen the end of the trade and tariff wars just yet. He added that the U.S.'s trade imbalance with China has not been addressed. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, this is pretty much what seems to be indicated by the Trump administration as well. Given uh, the recent news on Tillerson, it's very hard to predict uh, what this administration will do, uh, uh, both uh, for the good and the, uh, the unpredictable. Uh, the, uh, my worry is that the big issue, which is the trade imbalance with China, hasn't been addressed as yet. And there are measures that are floating through Washington, especially using Section 301 on unfair trade practices, uh, which are still to be seen. And those have to do with intellectual property and so on, uh, issues which are very dear to the Chinese heart. 
So my worry is that we haven't seen the end of this process yet. Uh, in fact, uh, we may be at an early stage, and there is more to come. So I would not uh, hold my breath saying, uh, you know, I would not uh, rest easy saying that we are, we're done. Uh, I think there's more to come. Won't hold my breath, says Raghuram Rajan, on the possibility of a de-escalation on the tariff war. A CBI special court has discharged Kalanithi and Dayanithi Maran in the illegal telephone exchange case. Jude Sanit caught up with Dayanithi Maran after the verdict. Here's what he had to say. In both the cases, the Justice Department found that this case is not fit to go for trial. Do understand that, this, that what does it mean? It means this case is so weak, they lacked evidences, they're just foisted on us just to defame us, just to put us in trouble, mm -hmm. and to ensure that our party also gets a bad name. Mm -hmm. It was pure professional je uh, jealousy, mm -hmm. political jealousy, mm -hmm. and all this has fallen apart. Mm -hmm. Today, in the second case, mm -hmm. today's judge said, it is not fit for trial. It's not fit, there's no material for trial. Mm -hmm. It's a big blow to the CBI. Well, uh, the charge against the Marans being dismissed, and this adds to the pressure the government is going to face after the 2G verdict setback. On that note, it's time for us to wrap up this edition of What's Hot. Before we go, here's a tribute to legendary scientist Stephen Hawking, the renowned theoretical physicist and cosmologist, died today at the age of 76. Take a look. I'll see you on India Business Hour in another 30 minutes.